Hello, everyone. I've read your comments and fixed all the mistakes that you pointed out. Thank you for leaving you constructive criticism and now enjoy. All right, so I work in customer service for a company that deals in household furniture, specifically anything that needs plumbing or electricity. My boss frequently says, nah, screw them, when asked if we're able to fulfill backwards requests. We're also 99 recommended and rated by customers. So this genuinely isn't bad service. We just don't deal with jerks. So enter entitled jerk who had bought items that were either A, out of stock due to a shipping delay because of the coronavirus, or B, able to be shipped to her next day. She had a hefty discount, think 50 off or so, automated email. Hi, entitled jerk. This is in reference to your order with us for item X. The item is out of stock due to the shipping delay, but we can send that on as soon as it's in the country at no cost to you. We can delay the full order until then, or we can cancel the order for a full refund. What would you like to do? Contact us on company phone number or respond to this email entitled jerk this is awful service you haven't even asked how i'm doing today your company delayed my items on purpose because i canceled my last order with you me i can assure you we didn't do that but if you'd like me to send on of every other item i can do that for you and have it there for the original delivery date not good enough i might well cancel okay i can cancel it i don't want to cancel it then i can get it to you with the other items or we can have all of it delivered together i want my items now Okay, I can upgrade your delivery for free to the next day for every other item. I want my items, and I want a full refund. Are you an idiot? Do you know what full refund means? What I actually say is, I understand that you're upset by this delay, but we're currently trying to get it to you as soon as possible, despite the coronavirus stopping the shipping routes we use. You're trying to give me a coronavirus-infected item? The shipping route we use is currently delayed due to the virus. The item has not been near the outbreaks. Your company is trying to make me and hardworking British people like me sick with some virus. Cancel my full order. Can you confirm you would like me to cancel the full order and issue you a refund for all the items? Yes. I don't want anything you've touched. Okay, your refund is X and will be with you in a few days. Did you cancel my order? As requested, yes. I want to speak to your manager right now. Here's where I pulled my boss over and showed him. He shrugged and said, screw them. Her cancellation is in writing. So the boss calls the entitled jerk a few hours later. Boss, hello. He got interrupted by the jerk. I was harassed into responding to a personal email while I'm at work because your employee would not stop messaging me. And I was missled the item. Because I was never told the items I ordered came from China and are going to make me sick. And then your employee canceled my order without asking me and is refusing to do anything about it. Ma'am, I can assure you that is not what happened. The email was sent to make you aware of the situation. It did not mean you needed to respond immediately. He explains the shipping route and health and safety thing again. I demand a refund. You're being refunded for the canceled order and the refund for my time. I'm at work right now. I understand that, but you chose to engage with us by responding to the emails and have kept up the correspondence as well as requested my time. I'm also at work and this is stopping me from being able to do the bulk of my job. Will you refund me for my time? What? What? Due to the cancellation being in writing earlier, we have canceled this order for you, which we are unable to reverse and will need you to place another order for the items you want, without the discount, if you would like to receive them. Either you have the items delivered together, have it delivered separately, or keep it canceled. Which do you want? Separately, but I want the free, upgraded delivery? I'm afraid that was taken off of the table when you accused my employee of lying to you. So now pay extra. So as background info... Me and three friends of mine were on a holiday trip on an island in our home country and just got back today, so this story is really recent. All of us are 16 years old, and it's our first time traveling on our own. Now to the story. This morning, we got up early to film some scenes on the beach for a little movie project for our rather unsuccessful YouTube channel. After we were done doing the ground shots, I was getting my drone, Mavic 2 Pro, so not that big, ready and noticed the usual skeptical eyes on me, which I'm used to now. Problem was that due to higher winds, I had to take off behind a little dun and not on the beach itself like I did the days before to avoid heavy winds during takeoff and landing, which results in more people watching me and me having to fly over the little beach to the bridge we wanted to film. So I took off and got away from the beach and crowd with my drone as fast as possible. After that, I immediately noticed someone approaching me from behind and it really was the typical Korean, just like you imagine her. I thought of Karen as more like a myth, but she really was one, like haircut style. Everything matched to Corrine. So she just starts yelling at me and wants to see my permit to fly here in a really aggressive tone. 
I started to explain that I actually don't need a permit to fly at this place, which she must have overheard in her screaming. She then yelled, um, did you just record us? Are you going to upload this to the internet? You are not allowed to fly film here. Me, still trying to stay calm, showed her my, at that moment, empty gallery of the drone, but just got, you can show me anything you want. Land right now or I will call the police. Drone was still hovering over the sea 150 miles away. At this point, I think I just should have shown her my droneite, which is required in the U to impress her. Now my friends joined and one of them, also a drone pilot, explained to her the law to which she just responded. No, this is illegal here. I call the police now. Then a second male, Karen also joined her and started screaming at us as well. Not her husband. He was just watching us 50 miles away. Although we really wanted to have that shot, we also didn't want to get in trouble with the police either. So I decided to land to save some battery. Both Karens are now starting to calm down a tiny bit, but not wanting to see my permits and laws either. So we got the drone back in its case and thought everything was over now. Not really satisfied because we actually were in the right. But as it turns out, it wasn't over yet. As my friends left to film a few shots on the ground, I stayed at the beach to look after our stuff. I got my laptop out to review some footage and upload a low-quality preview to Google Photos, which obviously required Wi-Fi, so I moved near to the dunes where Wi-Fi was available not seeing Karen standing 40 meters away. So I worked on the computer and walked and turned around while doing that because I was bored. After a minute doing so, Karen approaches me again, really furious and screaming at me. Now it's over. You film me with that thing, nobody uses a laptop on a beach. I'll call the police now. You stay where you are. Me, really confused because my laptop only has one camera covered by a sticker, said, am I even allowed to explain myself? But just getting you can explain to the police whatever you want in screaming as response. So here I was, not knowing what to do, emotional and a bit confused, sitting alone on the beach besides all our equipment waiting for the police. Five minutes later, my friends came back and after explaining to them what happened, they were just as confused as I was. Another ten minutes later, one young and one older officer arrived, dealing with the furious lady and not listening to our story, which made it seem like they were supporting the Karen. Because the public really doesn't like drones. I thought the officers would try to give us a bill or something. After she screamed at the officers the same way she screamed at us, really intelligent. Huh. The officers came to us and heard our side of the story. They were really nice and were completely on our side and even asked for our YouTube name and subscribed. So they just wanted to see the drone and my ID, then told us that it actually is legal. But if we fly again, they will have a call in 10 minutes again, which will just cost their time. They then left after this conversation with us. Best part was when the officers on their way out told the Karen to leave the beach because she was causing too much trouble. Most satisfying moment in life is seeing her face at this moment. So Karen left really, really mad, trying hard to avoid eye contact with us. So after we were done filming, we met her again, sitting angry in front of the entrance of the beach, and wished her a wonderful day, which blew her face for the second time. So that was my Karen story. Hope you enjoyed reading it. Have a nice day. This happened over five years ago, but I was reminded of it when my oldest was going through pictures. It's kind of long. So sorry in advance. In hindsight, going to the zoo with a service dog was not one of my best ideas, but my kids were still at the age where they liked it, plus my friend had her kids for the summer. Spoiler, no one tried to steal my dog. After getting tickets, I'm asked to go to the office so they can notify zoo security that there is a service dog in the zoo and to let me know what areas of the zoo I cannot go in. Basically, I couldn't go into any of the areas where the animals roam freely. Completely understandable. I finished up with the office. We start walking around, and one of the first big cat's enclosures we see is the jaguar. So beautiful, but I hate how small the enclosure is. I hate the zoo personally. And this is when the entitled parents start. Usually during the day, most of the animals are laying down, but today, I brought a dog into the zoo. The jaguar caught the scent of my dog and became extremely restless. The way the enclosure was built, only a chain-link fence and three feet separated us. My dog was just sitting next to me with this beautiful and deadly animal staring at us. Because the jaguar was active and close to the fence, people kept coming. Very quickly, I was trapped between the fence and a crowd. I have my dog for mobility and anxiety issues. Getting out of that crowd was difficult. Thankfully, my friend's fiancé saw me and pulled me out of there. When my friends saw the crowd building, they grabbed my kids and pulled them away. So that was the jaguar exhibit. Thankfully, the next enclosure was one that I couldn't go in, so I got to sit down for a bit. During this, I had a mom with two kids. Young, but I don't know how old. Demand I go back to the Jaguar so her kids could see him up close. Told her, no, not happening. She did the whole whining and yelling thing. But at that point, my kids and friends showed up. Told her, no again, and left. She started following us, but it's a zoo. I can't tell her where she can't walk as long as she isn't bothering us. 
Next big enclosure we get to is the wild dogs. This enclosure has viewing glass instead of chain link fencing. They perk up when they catch my dog scent as well. And again, we draw a crowd. This time, I have a lot of young kids pushed up to the front. Guess what? The kids have short attention spans. They saw the wild dogs and saw my dog. They were more interested in my dog. That exhibit was hell getting out of, as I didn't want to hurt any of the kids. So now instead of just one annoying mother dragging her kids behind us, we have multiple entitled parents with kids. Every enclosure we see, this crowd would push to get up front. If I left before one of them got to see the animal, they would demand I go back. Each enclosure, I was losing my grip on my temper. My friends saw this and did their best to try to keep me calm. We're at the tiger exhibit next, and now I'm wondering if the zoo even feeds the animals. The tiger is pacing and staring and gazing distance, trying to get to us. After about a minute of that, I couldn't stay there anymore. I was terrified that the tiger would take the risk and jump. But, again, the crowd. Now, I've had enough. I ended up telling the crowd to back up and get away from me. These parents got mad at me for using harsh language in front of their young children. How could I? Now, my revenge. Monkeys do not like dogs. At all. At all. They will go nuts if I go near their enclosure. Well, I had this lovely crowd of entitled parents who refused to leave us alone and we were coming up on some of the monkeys. Once the rest of the crowd caught up, I started going towards the money exhibit. My friends took my kids around the enclosure in case I didn't get out fast enough. As soon as I got close, the monkeys started yelling and jumping. The crowd was so excited, the monkey never jumped around. I got to the beginning of the exhibit and rushed through as fast as I could go. Limited mobility sucks but it was the crowd that had feces thrown at them. Afterwards, I was sitting with my kids and friends when one of the women came up to me yelling about how she never had monkeys throw gifts at her before and it's all my fault. Her screaming drew the attention of one of the zoo's security. After the woman started yelling at him about how awful I am and how she now had monkey gifts in her hair, that it's my fault, he asked me what she meant. I told him about how no matter where we went in the zoo, a crowd followed us and made the whole visit miserable. That woman started yelling that it's my fault for bringing a dog to the zoo. And if I didn't want the attention, then I should have stayed home. At that point, we were done with the zoo and decided to go get something to eat. This is how I learned that taking a service dog to the zoo is a bad idea. Thankfully, my kids are old enough that if they want to go to the zoo, they can go by themselves. My boy and I prefer places that have air conditioning. A few years back, I was the it contracts and supplier manager at a large company. Been there 25 years and had a lot of corporate knowledge having worked in multiple roles over that time. Also was very well paid due to length of tenure and experience at the company. A new uh, whole boss gets hired and proceeds to get rid of people he doesn't like and hires his buddies into various roles. The workplace culture took a nose dip pretty quickly. I knew my time was limited as I wasn't in his inner circle. Seeing the writing on the wall, I started looking for and applying for other roles. The a-hole boss gets me in their sights and decides to get rid of me, looking to move one of his recently hired buddies to my specialized role. He doesn't even understand what I do, needing a lot of technical knowledge combined with contract and legal. He tells me he wants to move me on to an upcoming project and to finish off what I'm currently working on and not take on any new work. Through all my contacts across the company, I knew there was no new project or even significant budget for one, but I'll do what I'm told. I wrap up my work and tell him I'm ready for the project. He says, sit tight, it's not far away, and don't start anything else. So I sit at my desk applying for other jobs and waiting. One of the jobs I applied for comes through and get an offer on a Friday morning. That same afternoon, the jerk boss comes around and says, the project isn't happening. And as you have nothing else on your plate, we will have to let you go. Yahtzee. I know there is heaps of work backed up and the shit is going to hit the fan soon when contracts aren't renewed, services canceled, etc. I also know my employment contract and they will have to pay a generous redundancy because the boss told HR my role isn't required anymore. I say, okay, I guess you will have to pay me redundancy too. Sure, he says, not knowing what he has agreed to. So I go through the redundancy process and at the same time accept the offer of the new job. Come my last day, I happily accept $200,000 payout. His face goes pale when he hears of the amount because it comes out of the team's budget. Walk out the door and into the new job the day after. Love my new job, less stress, great culture, a great team. Wish I'd left earlier, but then I wouldn't have got the payout if I resigned. Four weeks later, I hear the shit is hitting the fan and they advertise for a new person for my old role as no one knows what to do, because apparently my job was easy. He didn't even ask me to document what I did to hand over to anyone else. I don't have a drive. I keep the car in the public car park next to my flat. It's a two minutes walk. It has CCV that is actually being used, needed a footage for insurance purposes. Council was more than happy to look through three days of stuff, and the permit isn't that expensive. A few weeks after we moved here, I found my spot, 
Well, it technically wasn't mine. We don't have delegated spaces, but I used that spot for over a year and no one had any problems with that. It wasn't under any trees. It was next to a fence on one side, perpendicular to any other spot, so no one parked next to me on the other side. And it was easy to turn around. This is the only long-stay car park in the town center, so it's always fully packed between around 9 a.m. till 5, 6 p.m. Everyone works or shops in town uses this one. The spot I called mine was perfect in a sense that it was relatively far from any other spots except the other two behind it, and I used to do night shift, so I left the car there from 6.30 a.m. till 9 p.m., and this spot kept my car scratch and dent, free for over a year, except one time as one idiot reversed into my car, as workers, shoppers came and go, so all in all, it was perfect for me. A year or so later after I found my spot, someone new moved in some of the flats and wanted my spot. First, they started left their car there, even though they must have seen mine there pretty much every day. I didn't mind if it wasn't available, I parked on another spot. But if it was empty as I've got home in the morning, I used it as much as I could. When leaving their car there every now and then didn't work, they pulled their wheelie bins next to my car. It was strange, but I just put the bins back next to a wall. Next day, the bins were there again. I put them back again. Third day, bins there again. So I wrote them a polite letter and dropped into their letterbox. The flat number was on the top of the bins and asked them not to put their bins next to my car because if it's going to be windy and the bins scratch my car, they might be liable for the damages. Fourth day, the bins were there again. Wrote another letter, pointed out that their flat number is on the top of the bins so it's not a rocket science to figure out who they belong to and asked them again not to put their bins next to my car. I also pointed out that the CTV in the middle of the car park is actually functional, and I can ask the council to find out who and when puts the bins next to my car, and they might be liable for criminal damages, and since they blocked my car into a spot in a public car park, they also might be liable for causing an obstruction to the public highway, which again, is a criminal offense. Fifth day, the bins were there again. At this point, I was sure that they either don't speak the language and don't understand my letters, or they just generally don't give a shit about them, so I was moving their bins back next to the wall every day until bin collection day. It was four black wheelie bins for two flats. As I got home in the morning, I lined them up next to the fence and then very, very, very slowly parked next to them so close that my finger wouldn't fit between my car and their bins. And since I've got to the car park at 6.30 a.m. and the bin lorry usually came around at 7 a.m., I popped into Greg's, bought a coffee, sat back into my car, and waited for the collectors. When they arrived, they looked very confused and asked me why I blocked the bins in, so I quickly explained the whole story. They told me that the rule is if they can't reach a bin, they won't come back to empty it. And since my car is unfortunately blocking all four of those bins, they can do screw all. They gave me four tags that says they were unable to reach the bins to put on them once I'm done having fun, and they'll come back in two weeks to empty it. So that's what I've done. Once the bin lorry left, I put the tags on the bins and went home to sleep. Their bins with all the shit in it were there for the rest of the day until I left at 9 p.m., but miraculously weren't there the next morning I've got home. For the next two weeks, they tried to fill them as much as it was possible, but they had to resort to bin bags, which the bin lorry did not collect next time they came around. Just left a note on the bins that they can only collect what's in the bins. But as an extra, they put all the bin bags in the wheelies for shits and giggles. It took them a whole month to work down their rubbish, because the bins were always full of shit, but I've never had to move them again. Last year, I vacated a rental property in which I had resided for a few years. It was a pretty standard affair. The real estate agency was helpful, no real issues to report. They structured their business with a local office, which as far as I know, simply handled the affairs of the tenants, with a home office located elsewhere, which handled the back end and finances. When I signed my lease, I nominated to pay by bank transfer or electronic funds transfer. It's my preferred way, since I dictate exactly when payment is made and how much. I can also set it automatically so I never have to worry about it. It keeps the stress away. At the time, it was also the real estate agency's preferred payment method. Well, partway into my tenancy, I received a letter stating that my real estate agency was changing banks and that for the time being, they were no longer able to accept electronic funds transfer payments. They would have all tenants migrate to a third-party payment system. I was already unhappy with this decision since I didn't want to involve a third party regarding my rental payments. It seemed so unnecessary. The kicker, which really made me so mad, was that this company charged a fee for making your rent payment. A little digging into the motivation behind this change was quite revealing. In my country, the real estate agencies must use a trust account, a bank account to handle money on behalf of other people, the owners renting out their property. Typically, these involve a different fee structure and sometimes have a certain number of free transactions. 
part of the, the real estate agency's job is to reconcile these accounts, properly allocate money to the right portfolios. I did some research on this other third-party company to which I was supposed to make these rental payments. They handle rent payments and the bookkeeping on behalf of the real estate agencies. It seems they don't charge the real estate agency for this service, instead making the tenants pay for it. They also charge different fees depending on your payment method, which they conveniently don't advertise on the website. You only find out when your real estate agency sends you the sign-up form. In essence, my real estate agency wanted to save some time and money by throwing me and presumably the rest of their renting portfolio under the bus and making me pay a fee to pay my rent to a dubious third-party company. I was livid. Thankfully, my state saw these scammers coming. In rental tenancy law, they specifically state that a real estate agency must provide at least one method of payment, which does not incur a fee beyond banking fees. My agency, of course, did this, but used the most obnoxious method possible. Bank check. They knew people would be pressured to sign up for this system if their alternative was to write checks. But hey, they listed it as a valid form of payment, so cue the malicious compliance. I called my bank and immediately ordered a checkbook, shortly followed by an email to the real estate agency stating I would be making my payments via check from now on. On my way home, I stopped by my post office and picked up some registered mail envelopes. Game on. I was actually excited to do this, as I'd never written a check before. I had a spreadsheet made with all the information I could record. Check number, mail date, delivery date, cash date, tracking number, amount, you name it, I kept it. I also kindly notified the real estate agency that I had mailed the check and provided a tracking number so they could keep an eye on its delivery. Well, well, well. Several days after the first check arrived, the real estate agency's head office called me. They give me a grand story about how this new system they've migrated to is so good and how safe it is and how it's so convenient. I let her waffle on for a while and simply tell her that I'm not comfortable letting a third party handle my rent payments. I then tell her I'll think about it and hang up. I had no intention of changing my mind. Next day, I sent off another email stating I've considered it and I will remain paying by check. A few days before I mail my second check, yes, I'd only sent a single check at this point. I get another phone call. It's head offs again. They're asking me to reconsider migrating. Out of the hundreds of properties in their portfolio, I was the only one who was paying by check. They also gave me some sob story about how they had issues with fraudulent transactions with electronic funds transfer, which is a completely crappy excuse. My first thought was that it's really unfortunate that all these other tenants now have to pay a fee to have the privilege of paying their rent. But the real estate agency offered a compromise. They said that they could set me up on a specific profile, which meant that the the real estate agency would pay the fee, but that I would be required to pay via direct debit. There's no way in hell I'm letting anyone have direct access to my money least of all a real estate agent. Mind you, I'd never raised the fee as my concern. Bank check fees and mailing by registered post was slightly more expensive than the fees they would be charging anyway. My issue was the lack of control and the fact that the real estate agency was effectively lying to me as an excuse to save money. I politely declined their offer and mailed off the second check. Real estate agency buckled. They had no leg to stand on. They openly stated that check was an acceptable payment method, then got all fussy when their plan didn't work on me for the effort they tried to save reconciling my electronic funds transfer payment. They had to keep doing it on top of accepting delivery of a check, cashing it, and waiting for it to clear. They emailed me after they received the second check. Mr. X, we request that you make your rent payments via bank transfer from now on. Ah. Remember the first email they sent me? That they were changing banks and couldn't accept electronic funds transfer anymore? I wrote back, my pleasure. As you've changed financial institutions recently? Can you please forward me the details of your new trust account? The response I got back was, oh, so satisfying. Please just use the original details you were provided, and we will let you know if they change. Busted. Busted. Screw you, real estate agency. I caught you in your lie. I switched back to electronic funds transfer, as it was arguably more convenient for me. And despite my pettiness, I wanted to act in good faith. Though I was a little disappointed in getting prepared to mail checks and then abandoned my routine. They never changed their banking information for the remainder of my tenancy, by the way. It was all a ruse. So this happened a few days ago. For some background, the cafe that I work at saw some staff cutting back their hours and others quitting due to school restarting for the winter semester. As such, we hired a couple people. One person was someone whose resume has been in the owner's good potential stack for a couple months. The other was hired on recommendation of my coworker friend, their mutual friend. From what I understand, their interview went swimmingly and the cafe's owner was 100 sure they'd fit in. Our new assistant manager who sat in on the interview for training also agreed and said they were exactly who we were looking for. Good customer service skills, good communication, all good signs. 
However, on their first day of training, the first time many of us other employees met them, there were huge red flags. For instance, when I was talking to them and starting to introduce them to working on the espresso machines, I said my usual line, not exactly this, of these machines can be a bit tricky. They're stupid temperamental for no reason. So don't be discouraged if you make some mistakes at first. Instantly, the entitled hire actively cut me off by sticking his hand in my face and said, okay, stop right there. I don't make mistakes, so I'm just going to pretend I didn't hear that. Sure enough, he made plenty. No more than any average newbie, but he definitely did not make no mistakes. The new assistant manager was around when that happened and was watching everything play out, from how the entitled hire was acting to how they work. To quote the new assistant manager, that's not the same person we interviewed. It's not, what the hell's going on? The second major red flag came when we were talking a break, and I was talking to another coworker in the back. I was explaining to them how I disliked autism speaks and how, as an autistic individual, I thought they were an absolutely horrid representative of autistic individuals. As soon as I said, being autistic, that's when the entitled hire pounced. You're not autistic sage professional. You're a neurodiverse. I'm sorry. He was speaking condescendingly slow now and spelling neurodiverse for me. I heard that, but I'm both autistic and neurodiverse. I just prefer autistic B. Nope, you are neurodiverse. Autistic is an exclusionary term. You should stop using it. Autistic is... He interrupted me again. Stop me repeating myself. Oh. Stop me pissed at this. You don't get to choose what I call myself. I do if you're being prejudicial against neurodiverse people. At this point, I just decided to abandon the fight before it started Went to talk to the assistant manager. The assistant manager just assured me that maybe it would take some time for the entitled hire to warm up to me and instead volunteered to give their training over to someone else. The final major red flag came when, closer to the end of espresso machine training, he got frustrated and blamed the machine for his mistakes. Without even skipping a beat, he turned to my coworker friend and essentially kicked them off the second espresso machine. Move. I'm using this. Wait a second. I'm busy. The coworker friend told him, Yeah, well, I'm training, so move. He reached out and shut off the steam wand that the coworker friend was using to froth up some milk. Hey, I was. He smiled and pointed to the second machine. Go, go. Shoo. Go over there. That's yours now. My coworker friend, meanwhile, had continued on autopilot and had started pulling a shot for whatever reason. The entitled hire reached out to grab the handle of the portafilter. My guess is to stop the shot from pouring. To give some context, espresso shots are made by passing water through finely ground coffee under pressure. Our machines, if I remember correctly, get up to about 9 bar of pressure, roughly 8.8 times atmospheric pressure. Well, I wasn't sure, and still am not. If you could open the portafilter while it's pressurized, I didn't want to find out how big a splash of pressurized hot water it would create if all 9 bars of pressure were released at once. Before he could unlock the portafilter, I reached out and grabbed his hand and yanked it off. Assault. Assault. He shouted, You idiot, I told you that was pressurized. You assaulted me. The portafilter was pressurized, so you assaulted me. You would have sprayed everyone here with 90 degree water. Me. It's the coworker friend that made me do that to stop him. The coworker friend looking distressed now? What? But I didn't shut it. He was about to shove him. Me getting between them. Hey, don't touch him. The coworker friend looked quite intimidated, but I shut up. Shut up. You're just as responsible for not stopping Sage Professional from assaulting me. At this point, I grabbed both portafilters to stop both machines from working so the entitled brat couldn't do anything else stupid and took them with me while I stormed off to the office where my supervisor was counting cash. The brat followed, but I locked the door. He started yelling and pounding on the door while I told my supervisor what happened. Luckily, my supervisor had also had enough of him and decided to send them home, though not without a fight. The entitled brat argued and blamed everyone else but themselves for his mistakes and for potentially putting our physical safety at risk. But eventually he left. After he left, my coworker looked like he was going to be sick to his stomach. While we all told him it wasn't his fault, it turned out like this. He took it pretty hard, and it was his fault that he didn't move to the other espresso machine. That if he moved quicker, nothing would have happened. After talking with them a little, I got the impression that the friendship between the brat and coworker friend is abusive and toxic at best with the brat basically belittling him to pad their ego and superiority complex, and that his recommendation had probably been bullied out of them by the brat. Today, my manager, who heard the accounts of me, my coworker friend, the supervisor, and a regular that had been in at the time, they called the entitled brat and told him he's fired and to not come again and to expect their pay to come in the mail.